Well, good morning. Welcome to our online service at VPO Baptist Church. It's a great joy to gather together in the Lord's presence and to, to lift high His name as we worship God today. As we continue our rebuild, as we move into all that God has for us. We're told in Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 that we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not in our own understanding and all our ways to acknowledge Him and he will keep our paths straight. We can trust in God. We can rely on God today. We can look to God and be led by God. He'll provide, he'll guide. He's all that we need. And today we want to open up our hearts to him. We want to seek him. We want to desire him. And we trust that indeed as we draw close to God, he will draw close to us. Please check out the website and the bulletin, the Facebook page, and you'll get information about what's going on in the life of the church. Small groups are regularly happening. We have our church family barbecue next Sunday, so I'd encourage you to, to be part of that. And as I say, other events and information is included in the bulletin. But if you are new to the church, please connect with us. Um, please email the office, fill in a, a GDPR form which gives us permission to send uh, information to you, to have your details. Um, that would be great just so that we can communicate with you with your permission. Um, we're really excited as to how God is growing and building his church. Um, so I'm glad that you feel part of the family. Um, so if you're new, um, we want to get to know you more. But let's just pause to pray just now. Lord, I just thank you that you're with us. I thank you, God, that you're for us and not against us. I thank you that you have promised that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. You've promised that you'll be with us even through the darkest valley. And God, I ask that today, by your Holy Spirit, that you'll move in our midst, that you'll speak into our lives, that you'll touch our lives afresh. You are good. You are faithful. You are Father. And we call you Abba, Father, Daddy. Thank you that we're no longer slaves to fear, but we're children of God. And today we can choose faith and not fear. God, meet with every person today. May every person who's connecting today know that they are loved by God. May they hear your voice today. May they encounter you afresh today. Holy Spirit, move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's join together as we sing and worship our God.
Good morning. We're going to begin this morning by playing a game of Would You Rather. I'm going to show you two pictures at a time and I'd like you to decide which of these two things you would rather have or do. Are you ready? Here's the first one. Would you rather have chocolate or fruit gums? Would you rather go in a car or on a train? Fish supper or pizza? Red or blue? Hot summer sunshine or snow? Swimming or running? Crafts or video games? Read a book or watch a film? We make lots of choices every day of our lives and many of them are not very important choices. We make different choices because we like different things. But there are also choices we make that are much more important, either because of the impact they have on other people or for ourselves. So for example, we make choices about the kind of food we're going to eat on a regular basis. We make choices about what job we will do or how we will spend our time. We make choices about how hard to try or whether we might be lazy or even cheat. We make choices about whether to be kind and helpful and honest or whether to be unkind, maybe even cruel or tell lies. A man met Jesus and he had a very important choice to make. He was a very wealthy man. He had lots of money and lots of belongings and he was an important man. And he was also a very good man. He tried very hard to obey the rules that God gave for his people to live by. And one day when he met Jesus, he asked Jesus, what do I need to do if I want to be sure to go to heaven when I die. And Jesus told him that what he needed to do was to choose to follow Jesus, to put Jesus first in his life and to give away all of his money to help poor people. That was a really difficult choice for the man because all the things that he had were very important to him. We also have a choice to make about whether we want to follow Jesus and put him first in our lives or whether we'd rather hang on to the things that are important to us and make all our own choices. You know, following Jesus isn't always easy. God didn't promise that following Jesus would be easy. It can mean letting go of things that may have been important to us. Jesus might ask us to do things that we find very difficult to do. We might find that people make fun of us for following Jesus. But if we choose to follow Jesus and put him first, then we need to remember that Jesus has promised that he will always be with us. He will always look after us. He will always forgive us if we make mistakes. And he'll always show us the way that he wants us to go and the things that he wants us to do. You know, Well, let's continue to worship God as we join together in prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We come before you, just reaching out to you, desiring you. We thank you that you incline an ear towards us, that you listen to our prayers, that we can communicate with you, that it's not just about us telling you what we want you to hear, but God, that you speak to. It's two-way communication. It's a relationship that you're a living God, you're very much alive, you still speak today, you still act today, and you still are the miracle maker, you can still do what only you can do, you can do the impossible, you're the God of the impossible, and today we want to pray for those who are grieving, Lord we want to pray for the family of Maureen Cameron, we continue to ask for your presence with them, as they attend her funeral on Wednesday. 
Lord, I just ask that they would know your peace. Pray for myself as I take the service, Lord. And God, I just ask for comfort for all who will attend and for all who are grieving her loss. We continue to pray for, for Tony and the family, uh, their loss of TJ. Uh, just be close to them. And Lord, for others who are grieving at this time, others who are, who are lonely following the loss of a loved one, even if it's been years ago, Lord, I just pray you continue to, to be their strength, to be their help. Lord, we want to pray today for those who are unwell. Lord, we ask for your healing touch on those who need it today. We pray, um, Lord, for those who are weighed down with anxiety, with depression. Lord, be their strength, be their hope. And Lord, we pray for families, we pray for marriages, uh, we pray for, for all who need a touch at this time. Lord, where there needs to be healing, where there needs to be reconciliation, where there needs to be restoration. God, you are the God of the impossible. So Lord, we look to you. God, we pray today for our nation. We pray for our parliament at Holyrood and at Westminster. Lord, we just ask that you would give wisdom to our leaders, that God, that they would sense your presence. Lord, we pray for those who do not know you, that they would come to a saving faith in Christ. And Lord, we pray that this nation would be guided uh, by the teachings of the Bible, that we know that God's way is the best way, Lord. So I pray, God, bring a turning back to you in our nation. Lord, do the miraculous in these days. And God, as we come to your word now, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word, for the truth of your word. And Lord, we ask quite simply that you would speak through your word, even now, even in these moments right now, God. Come and speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're continuing our series in Nehemiah called Rebuild. And today we are considering the topic of faith not fear faith not fear so let me read the verses in chapter 2 in Nehemiah beginning at verse 11 I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days I set out during the night with a few others I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem there were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on by night I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dungi, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God that was on me. And what the king said to me, they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. May God bless the reading and reflection upon his word this morning. I remember one Hogmanay a number of years ago, the minister at Wester Hills Baptist Church preaching a short message on Joshua chapter 1. And the title for his message was, Have Faith and Not Fear this new year you know God had called Joshua to a massive mammoth task which involved great responsibility after Moses had died 
He was to lead the people of God into the promised land. This calling would involve a lot of stress, a lot of opposition and many battles, but also many blessings. It wouldn't be easy, but it was God's call. And if God calls, he equips. In fact, God gave Joshua many promises. Joshua 1 verse 3, I will give you every place where you set your foot. Joshua 1 verse 5, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. Joshua 1 5 as well, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Joshua 1 6, you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers. Joshua faced what seemed an impossible task. However, God urges him to have faith and not fear. Joshua 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you this? Have I not commanded you this? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua faced what seemed like an impossible task. But with God, the task ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us. Joshua would testify at the end of his life, just before he dies, that God kept all his promises. Joshua 23 verse 14, he says before the people, not one of God's promises failed. He kept every one. Have faith, not fear. Nehemiah was also a man of great faith. In Nehemiah chapter 2, we see clear evidence of his faith. We're told in chapter 2 verse 11 that God had put in his heart to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We're told there, verse 11, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. He went to Jerusalem. He was called by God to be part of this work, to lead the rebuilding of the walls. God had called him and he was obedient. However, he did have the faith to wait for the right time to go. We read in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 2 last week. And he had the faith to ask the king King Artaxerxes at the right time verses 4 to 8 at the the God appointed time he asked the king to send him to Jerusalem. He didn't stop there he asked for even more. He asked for letters of introduction that would guarantee safe travel and hospitality between Susa and Jerusalem. He also requested letters of authority that would provide materials needed for the construction of the building of the walls Artaxerxes gave him what he asked but it was the good hand of God that made him so cooperative we're told in verses 7 to 8 you know God has a calling on our lives as believers the hand of almighty God is with us therefore friends we can have faith and not fear we're told in Nehemiah 2 verse 9 that King Artaxerxes also sent army officers and cavalry with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was actually given an armed escort um, as he was officially Judah's governor. You know, there's a song by Chris Tomlin that reminds us as believers that we have the God of angel armies with us. It's called, Whom Shall I Fear? Let me just read some of the lyrics. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, and I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies. Friends, whether you know, you're on the mountaintop or in the valley, like Joshua and Nehemiah, with God on our side, We are called to have faith and not fear. In faith, in obedience to the word of God, which is so important, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem, verse 11. 
And I just want to reflect on what he does on his arrival in Jerusalem as he faces this momentous task. Two things I want to mention today. First of all, he recharges his batteries. And then secondly, he surveys the situation. So first of all, he recharges his batteries. It might surprise you that the first thing he does is rest and take his time to be refreshed. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. First thing he does is rest. You know, so much work to be done and so little time. He needed to get on with the work. However, he prioritizes rest. He takes time to recharge his batteries. It's amazing how many batteries kids' toys take. We spend a lot of time trying to recharge batteries in my house. If the batteries are running low, the toy gets slower and slower until it eventually grinds to a halt and then I need to recharge the batteries again. But it's true in life as well. We're no different. We can't just keep running and running and running unless we're recharging our batteries, unless we're taking time to rest and recuperate. We need to take that time to be replenished, to recharge our batteries. Someone once said, you can't pour from an empty cup. We must take care of ourselves and our own walk with God as of first importance. Yes, we must work and work hard for the kingdom of God. We must work hard in what God has asked us to do. But we must also rest well and play well as well. We must have fun in our lives. But God must come first. Jesus was a supreme example to us of what it means to have a good rhythm in our lives. He was often busy but never in a hurry. If you turn to Mark 1 verses 35 to 39, we we see an example of this. It had been an amazing 24 hours in Jesus' ministry. He had done several amazing miracles demonstrating his authority and his power. News about him spread throughout Galilee, we're told in verse 28. The whole town had gathered at the door, verse 33. And you might expect so that he would now strategically move on to the next opportunity for ministry as there was so much need. But no, let me just read verses 35 to 39 as we see what happens, what he does next. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. You know, Jesus went to get rest, to spend time with his father, in a sense to recharge his batteries. Here, Jesus models the life of discipleship. He models the rhythm of life for the Christian. He was often busy, but never in a hurry. He knew what it was to work, rest, and pray. Jesus prioritized times of rest and times of prayer. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up and went to a solitary place and he prayed. This pattern is found in many occasions in the Gospels. Let me mention a few examples. First of all, when he was baptized, we're told that he was praying. Luke 3 verse 21. Then Luke 9 29, when he was transfigured, we're told as he prayed, the fashion of his face was altered. We're told Luke 6 verse 12, before he chose the 12 apostles, he spent the night praying to Father. Mark 14, 32, when tempted in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, sit here while I pray. Friends, we need to learn in this the immense importance of private devotion and prayer in our lives. 
Many people are living powerless Christian lives because they are living prayerless Christian lives. Maybe the Lord is calling you to prioritize more time for prayer, more time for rest, to recharge your batteries. It's so, so important in our lives that we we take that time. Let me read some verses from Mark chapter 6. Powerful verses that, that just speak about what it means to be prioritizing this in our lives. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. There's times when we need to be in that quiet place to get some rest. Sometimes one of the most spiritual things you can do is get a good sleep. We need to sleep well. We need to eat well. We need to exercise well. We need to pray well. We need to look after ourselves. We need to love God with our whole beings, with our heart, our mind, our body, our soul. We need to love God and worship God with everything that we have. And we need to have a good rhythm in our lives. We need to take time to rest and to rest well. Maybe Jesus is saying to you today, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. You know, find ways that fit your lifestyle to make this possible. Always make time to create good habits. It's so easy to fall into bad habits, but let's create some good habits in our lives. As life gets busier, our spiritual disciplines and habits become even more important. So we think about Nehemiah here. There's so much work to be done. But before he starts, he takes time to rest. For leaders must take care of themselves if they're going to be able to serve the Lord. He recharged his batteries. Secondly, we see that he surveyed the situation. Verses 11 to 16. He rested. Now surely now, after the rest, he'll get his hands dirty and get stuck straight into the work. There's so much work to do in so little time. But initially, he wisely surveys the situation before he proceeds any further. He had heard reports about the state of Jerusalem but he wanted to see what the situation was like for himself. This is real wisdom shown here by Nehemiah. He had taken on board what others had said, but he wanted to see the situation firsthand. He takes time to get the lay of the land without arousing the concern of the enemy. A good leader doesn't rush into his work, but patiently gathers the facts firsthand and then plans his strategy. We're told in Proverbs 18 verse 13 that who answers, whoever answers before listening, that is his folly and shame. We're told that Nehemiah set out during the night to inspect the walls. Verse 12. Leaders are often awake when others are asleep and working when others are resting. Nehemiah didn't want the enemy to know what he was doing. And that's why he investigated the ruins at night. By keeping his counsel to himself, Nehemiah prevents Tobiah's friends from getting information they could pass on to Sanballat. Who were these people? Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem that were told about in Nehemiah chapter 2. Well, there were three enemies of the Jews who make several attempts to stop Nehemiah from the God-given work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Sambalat and Tobiah are first mentioned in Nehemiah 2 verse 10. Um, they're upset about Nehemiah's potential work. 
when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. In verse 19, they along with Geshem the Arab mocked Nehemiah, saying, What is this you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? When this construction was taking place, their anger grew. Nehemiah 4 verse 1, When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. Nehemiah faced opposition. And friends, when God is working, when God is on the move, when God is rebuilding, we will face opposition. We are in a spiritual battle. We have an enemy who wants to steal, kill and destroy. And sadly he can work through people. And he wants to hinder the work of the kingdom of God. So as Viewfield Baptist is growing, as we are taking more ground, we need to be on our guard. We need to stand strong in unity. We need to pray and keep watch and ask for the Lord's protection upon us. God's at work. He's rebuilding. He's working through us. The God of heaven will give us success. We're getting on with this work. But friends, be aware that we will face opposition. We will face challenges. A wise leader knows when to plan, when to speak, and when to work. Nehemiah showed wise leadership regarding how he approached this task. And we must all be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves because the enemy is always watching and waiting and ready to attack. Can I say to you again, let's stand together. Let's not let any issues come in that will cause disharmony. Let's be humble. Let's give God the glory and let's be kind and gracious and merciful and loving towards one another. Friends, it's not about just what we want. It's not about what I want. It's about what God wants. And we're the body of Christ. And it's not me church. It's his church. And we want him to get all the glory. All the glory. Nehemiah was also a realist. He wasn't living in a dream world. As he surveyed the situation, he moved from the west to the south to the east, concentrating on the southern section of the city. It was just as his brother had said. The walls were broken down. The gates were burned, we're told in Nehemiah 2.13. The leaders must not live in a dream world. Nehemiah accepts the facts. This is bad news. This is a bad situation. This is difficult. But God had called him. And God would empower. And the God of heaven would give them success. Nehemiah saw more at night than the residents saw in the daylight. For he saw the potential as well as the problems. And that is what makes a great leader. He was a great leader because his faith was in what God could do. He had faith and not fear. And that's the word I want you to hear today. Whether you look at Joshua, whether you look at Nehemiah, friends, whatever character you look at in the Bible who showed faith, be inspired. We need to move forward in faith with a confidence in God who can do the impossible. He's the God of the impossible. Just as I finish, I want to just share an illustration. The African impala can jump to a height of over 10 feet and cover a distance of greater than 30 feet. Yet these magnificent creatures can be kept in an enclosure in any zoo with a three foot wall. The animals will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will fall. Faith is the ability to trust what we cannot see. And with faith, we are freed from the flimsy enclosures of life that only fear allows to entrap us. So I say to you today, please, friends, have faith and not fear. He's the God of the impossible. If he's called you, he'll equip you. He is able, more than able. The God of heaven will give us success. We 
his servants will get on with the work of rebuilding to the glory of our God. Let's respond to God's word by singing together before we share communion. Let's sing. come now to gather around the Lord's table to remember the death of our precious Saviour and to give thanks to God for who he is and for what he has done for us in Christ that we the guilty ones go free because of the atoning death of the Son of God and we are so thankful we want to praise him we want to worship him today as we remember him I want to read some verses as we continue the theme of faith as well First of all, from Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. 
By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And then we're told by faith, and it goes through names of men and women who achieved amazing things by faith in God. They had a confidence in God. They weren't perfect, they made mistakes, but they had faith in God. And then we get to chapter 12. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So we want to consider him today. We want to fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, as we eat bread and drink the cup. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you love the world so much that you sent your one and only Son. Jesus, we thank you that you, the eternal Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And that you humbled yourself even unto death on the cross and your flesh was torn for us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you've opened our eyes to the wonder of the Gospel. Father, Son and Spirit, we praise you. We worship you. And today as we eat bread, we remember the body of Christ given for us. As we drink the cup, we remember his blood shed for us. And we know that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Thank you, God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy shown in Christ. Thank you for your goodness towards us shown in Christ. Thank you that through faith in Christ, by the grace of God, that we are saved. It's not through our human works so that no one can boast, but all by your grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thank you, God. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. On the night you would be betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body given for you. Whenever you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. Let's eat together the body of Christ given for us. the same way after supper the Lord Jesus took the cup and he said this cup is a new covenant sealed by my blood whenever you drink this do so in remembrance of me friends let's drink together as a sign of our unity in Christ the blood of Christ shed for you Jesus, your death we remember, your resurrection we confess, your final coming we await, all the praise and the glory be unto you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday and we'll connect again soon.